Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. It's Thanksgiving week here in the United States. I've been off work all week and been busy in the lab and among other things, I have finished the two-tone audio generator. Let's take a look at it. All right, it's time to put this project into a case. This one here is a classic Archer design that I picked up at a ham fest, along with several other Radio Shack specials. I'd really like to use a metal one for this project to have it somewhat shielded, so this guy will work just fine. It's more than likely a few decades old, but it's still in pretty decent shape. I do like the black wrinkle finish on the cover, it looks pretty sharp. The front and back panels, however, are a little rough, but no worries, I'll be covering those with graphics anyway and in my usual obsessive fashion, I've made a 3D model of the controls layout. Starting from the left, I'm gonna use a small slide switch for the power switch. Then two toggle switches, one each for the two audio frequencies. This rotary control just off center is the six position attenuator. And then lastly, the two knobs on the right are the level and balance controls. There's a method to my madness here. Creating this 3D model allows me to generate a scale template for the exact locations I want for each of the controls. Now I've used this method many times before in my projects, so I'm going to skip through a lot of the details. I do want to mention though, one lesson I've learned is to always use a piece of wood behind the panel when you're using the center punch. That provides some backup force and prevents the punch from dimpling this thin aluminum, even with the punch adjusted to a light force. Jumping ahead a bit, here's the completed hole pattern. The hole for the slide switch is rectangular, and that took a bit of work with the nibbler and a file. On the back panel, I changed my mind after I'd center punched it. But no worries, the graphics will cover up these two unused divots. Oh, and this is really flimsy aluminum, so I gotta be careful not to bend it. Let's look at the controls. The level and balance controls naturally are potentiometers. Now these have anti-rotation tabs on them. Ordinarily, you'd make an additional small hole in the panel for these tabs to fit into, or just cut them off like a lot of people do and take the chance that the mounting nut won't loosen up over time. I really did not want to drill a small hole for it in the front panel, so I came up with a better idea. Because they're relatively close to one another, I designed up and 3D printed this 2mm thick spacer shared by both of them. It has the smaller holes off to the side to receive the anti-rotation tabs, so the pots will not be prone to spinning. Plus, the 2mm thickness spaces the pots back just a bit further so there's less exposed threads on the bushings. Now that's a win-win situation. Next up is the power switch. I decided to use one of these little slide switches that I salvaged decades ago. This design needs double pull, double throw action to connect the two 9 volt batteries. This switch is actually a triple pull double throw switch, so it overachieves. Next come the two toggle switches for the two frequencies. Nothing fancy about these, except they also need a means to prevent rotation. More about that in a minute. And then lastly, I needed a single pull six throw rotary switch for the attenuator. Now this one I did not have in the junk box, so I bought one new. And of course, it also has an anti-rotation pin that I need to accommodate somehow. I designed and 3D printed a spacer for all of these controls too. The left end has counterboard holes to receive the heads on the tiny screws that hold the slide switch. The middle two holes have a tall rib in between them to provide anti-rotation against the body of the toggle switches. And then I put in a hole to receive the anti-rotation pin on the rotary switch. Attaching the slide switch to the spacer uses a pair of number two screws. Now these guys are pretty tiny and it took a bit of finesse to get them in place. Luckily there was enough clearance for the nuts on the other side to not interfere with the slider. The final assembly looks really neat and the switch is securely attached with no fasteners needed from the front panel. The last item that needed a bit of creativity was finding a means to secure the two 9 volt batteries. I did not find an off the shelf dual 9 volt battery holder that I liked, so you guessed it, I designed and 3D printed my own. The two batteries fit into it vertically. It's actually two pieces, the same part top and bottom. Attaching it to the case requires inch and a half long number six screws. 
I'll probably use wing nuts on them to make removing and replacing the batteries just a little bit easier. So that's it for the mechanical bits and pieces. Next up, I want to talk about the front and back panel graphics. I want to take a moment to talk about the graphics for this project, and I'm using a technique here that I really like. I've used it on several of my projects to date. Um, in particular, my Spectrum Analyzer, the Heathkit AV3 that I rebuilt uh, to run off of uh, a different circuit and run off of battery power. And then also on my simple home-built uh, amateur radio HF receiver. And the process is actually pretty simple, what I do. Um, design the graphics to scale in Microsoft Publisher. I inkjet print them out on regular paper, and then I laminate them using 5 mil stock. And I like that for several reasons. One is, obviously, with doing the um, design in Publisher and printing out, I can get pretty wide choice of colors and fonts and graphics and all that. It's very, very flexible for that. But one of the big advantages is the lamination uh, has a natural durability to it. It's got that plastic film on top, so you know it's not going to be very easy to scratch or wear off the graphics, and that uh, gives a nice durability for that. So for this project, I chose a pretty simple look, very functional graphics. Obviously, I've got the big one here in the middle is the attenuator and the various settings for it, the balance and level controls, the two audio selections, and then the power switch. So uh, I did skip over in the mechanical video that I do have stuff on the back. There is, of course, the B and C connector is going to go here, and then there's going to be another toggle switch here for impedance. So you can select either 600 ohm or 50K, low impedance, high impedance output for the generator. Now, one thing that I did um, different here um, is I used contact adhesive, the spray-on contact cement to hold these laminations on the front and the back. And that is kind of a challenge of how to attach these. And what I've done a couple different techniques before, like on the AV3 restoration, I would design and 3D print this frame that goes around the outside and that hides the edges of the laminated stock and also traps it in place so it doesn't lift up. On the simple HF receiver, because I have an overlapping a cover on there, there's no glue, there's nothing holding it on. It's basically just the uh, you know the various controls that are pinching it. So I decided to try the contact adhesive and I think it worked really well. Um, we did the technique where you spray it on both pieces and let it dry until it's tacky and then stick them together. And of course I had to uh, you know make sure I had some way to pilot the two pieces together. I did I think an okay job, but the other thing that kind of struck me is for trimming these. I made them oversized and I just went around the edge with a utility knife and exacto knife to trim them so they're perfectly flush. I still have this issue of what to do with the bottom. In fact, there's a little bit of sticky residue here that I need to clean up with some acetone. Um, there isn't really a cool nifty thing I've come up with to trim off or trim up this bottom edge, but I think it's going to look just fine, especially when I take the cover and put it together. You know, those edges are going to be hidden around the three sides. So for a home-built project, I think this looks pretty good. All right, I finished the mechanical assembly and electrical wiring, and I did not film any of that because, A, it didn't take very long, only a couple of hours, and B, it's actually kind of boring. There's not that much going on here and don't really need a bunch of B-roll footage. So just cut to the chase. It wired up just fine. I only made a couple of small mistakes. I had put the... Uh, the two switches for the frequency on and off and backwards. I was thinking that when the switches were closed that that would turn the oscillators on and it doesn't. The way that circuit works is when they're closed they're off. So I had those upside down and I'd also reversed the connections for the level but those were pretty easy to fix once I you know, powered it up for the first time and saw what was going on. So all in all I uh, can't complain about that. Overall wiring uh, is pretty simple. I'll do a zoom in shot here so we can take a closer look at that attenuator that I had to build on the rotary switch. Now there's a couple ways you could do that. I mean this switch is made to be soldered through through hole uh, construction into a PC board. I just did standing resistors and just built up the ladder for the attenuation circuit that way. So that's going to work just fine. Other things that I have in here that uh, came from junk box actually some salvaged coaxial connectors these are from an old piece of test equipment that i tore apart years ago i got about a dozen of these guys these are perfect for 
lower frequency, low level signals. And then, of course, a knob on the front. Salvage that from, I don't know, something years ago. Forgot what it was, but it's a perfect knob to use here for the attenuator. And then for the balance and the level, I just designed and 3D printed some that are very similar to ones that I made on prior construction. Uh, the battery holder, that's working great. Those 9 volt batteries are not loose at all. They're clamped in with just a little bit of light pressure, so I'm happy with how that turned out. So the next thing to do here is to put the cover on it and hook it up to the scope and check it out. Okay, I've got the signal generator connected up to the Siglent scope and I'm going to do dual cameras here because I finally realize that trying to show on one camera shot um, the, the oscilloscope screen while I'm doing some adjustments on a piece of equipment just doesn't show very well at all. You can either see one well and the other one blurry or vice versa. So here we go, give this a try. All right, so I'm gonna turn on the low frequency, the 700 Hertz, and we can see now I've already adjusted the level here. I'll, I'll play around with that a little bit right now. I try to get it to about one volt RMS on the reading on the Siglent, so pretty close right there. Okay, I'll shut off the 700 Hertz. Oh, and before I do up right hand corner, you can see it's 702 Hertz, so that's pretty much spot on. Then the 1.8 kilohertz, and once it settles down, it's 1.817 and fraction, so that's pretty darn close. Now, I can also adjust the balance. I think it's the high frequency? No, it's the lower frequency. That's where I adjust it. So what I need to do here, if I'm gonna try to give it the same, I need to turn on the high frequency, and I'll set the level here. I'll try to get it to right at about one volt RMS, just for kicks. Okay, pretty close. Go back to 700 hertz, and then I can adjust the balance here to try to get those both to the same magnitude. And there we go, that's pretty close. And of course, if I turn them both on, I get this <laughs> bizarre looking signal in the time domain. Now, of course, in the frequency domain, there'd be two signals there, one at each of the two frequencies. So let me shut off the high frequency one, because the last thing I want to demonstrate here, uh, actually there's two things I want to demonstrate. So I've got the impedance switch on the back set to 600 ohms output. Now the input to the scope is one mega ohm, so it really doesn't change much, but it does change slightly if I go to the higher impedance. And if I had set this up with, say, an inline load at about 600 ohms, then we'd see the signal drop quite a bit when I'm switching between impedance levels, but that at least shows me that it's working. And then the last thing I want to demonstrate here is the attenuator. So right now, again, I've just got the 700 hertz signal running. It's about one volt RMS. If I go to 20 dB of attenuation, I should see about 100 millivolts RMS, and I do. Now the scope's not syncing because the trigger's not set for a signal that low, but we can see it's about one, um, uh, I'm sorry, 100 millivolts. And if I go to 40 dB and then adjust the scope, let's see here, I should see about 10 millivolts RMS. And that makes sense because this is a power attenuator. So for a 10 to 1 change in um, voltage magnitude would represent 20 dB of change. So that, if it makes sense to you guys, it makes sense to me. <laughs> that this is working correctly. So the next thing I want to do here is try to hook it up to my home-built transmitter and play around with that um, tiny SA spectrum analyzer and see if I can more accurately measure the two-tone interference. Okay, and for the final segment in this episode, I'm going to make my first stab here at trying to make two-tone interference measurements on my home-built and with your radio transmitter, and then of course using the Tiny SA Ultra uh, to measure it. Now I'm um, kind of pushing the envelope here a little bit because the Tiny SA uh, using it for two tone interference is a bit of a grasp here. Among other things, um, the finest resolution bandwidth you can set is 200 hertz, and even at 200 hertz, with the screen uh, set the way I'm showing it here, and with the tightest, lowest, and highest frequency to capture as much of this as possible without going too far. Still takes about eight seconds to do a scan. So I have to key 
the transmitter for at least eight seconds to get one reading. So my best hope for doing this is to at least give me some insight for improving my transmitter because one of the things I was concerned about in that series was the two-tone interference just didn't look very good. Uh, I was measuring at the time on my siglent, but nonetheless I was concerned. So what I've done today, and I'll do a little side video here to show how what the setup looks like. I've opened up the transmitter and I'm only looking at the output of the preamp. So I have the final power amp disabled. The signal is going into a um, step dB attenuator that I got set to 43 dB of attenuation. That's the maximum attenuation before it goes into the tiny SA. And then of course I got the two-tone audio generator hooked up. I'm injecting the audio signals uh, ahead of the mixer but downstream from the uh, microphone preamp because I don't need that stage. So I've been playing around with it. I've got it set up. So let me try a scan here and I'm gonna have to try to catch the tiny SA when it's at the end of a scan. So I'm gonna take a quick peek at it here. And it looks like right about now. So here we go. So I keyed the transmitter on. I gotta let it run for at least eight seconds here. And when I get it, I'll let it go. There we go. So I'm seeing a pattern. Uh, it's not telling me um, anything that I didn't already know, but oh, that disappeared. So I need to find a way to, to save those. But the point being, I want to try to use this again to try to improve the performance of my home built um, HF transmitter. I don't have the luxury of buying an actual benchtop spectrum analyzer. I think most of us electronic tinkerers and hams don't have budgets that big, but I think at least this is going to help me now that I've got this two-tone audio generator and I can set it up. And I should say that I did set it up to try to get each of the tones uh, balanced. So single tone at 700 set, single tone at 1800 hertz were giving me the same output single pip before I did the mixing of both signals. So that alone is better than the audio generator I had before. So at this point, I've got a new piece of test equipment that's only going to help me improve the projects that I build here. So that is it for this short series on this two-tone audio generator. I do hope you enjoyed watching it. I know I'm going to enjoy using this new piece of test equipment to help me improve my home-built transmitter and future projects. Now, I would add two things at the end of this episode that were a little lessons learned. One, <laughs> I definitely need to dust the screen on my Siglent and my Tiny SA before I do those close-up camera shots. There's dust on there that we just can't see, but clearly these 4K cameras, higher resolution cameras, don't miss a thing. So got to make sure I clean those in the future. Um, the second thing, a little more practical, is the ARRL circuit that I copied here doesn't have any reverse voltage protection. And as anyone knows, it's so easy to accidentally touch the battery backwards on those 9-volt battery clips. And if I happen to leave the power switch on, that could be bad news for the circuit. So those electrolytic caps are not going to tolerate it very long. So an easy future improvement would be put some blocking diodes in there so that you don't apply reverse voltage or some other similar reverse voltage circuit. So I'll just have to be careful whenever I'm switching the batteries in this. So as always, I do thank you for watching my channel and until next time, bye for now.